Hello friends and welcome to my November reading wrap up where we are going to rank and review all of the books that I read in the month of November. It is a pretty warm day here in Melbourne so I'm going to try and be as quick as possible uh, but we've got to start with the stats. These come from the story graph. So in November I read 19 books for a total of 4,113 pages which is an average of about 216 pages per book. The main moods that I read in November were adventurous, lighthearted, mysterious and emotional. For the pace of the books that I read 40% were medium paced 33% were fast paced and 27% were slow paced. So much more sort of like even spread this month than I've had in previous months. 74% of the books that I read were under 300 pages long and 26% of them were between 3 and 500 but no books were over 500 pages this month. That is a lot of noise Ollie. Are you okay? Do you want to say hi? Here's Ollie looking very fluffy. She's got a haircut booked in a couple of days so I think it's well overdue. Apparently I read 7% non-fiction this month, uh, but I don't know that I would really class the book that it is classing as non-fiction, as non-fiction myself. We'll talk about that later. Now for the genres. The trend continues. I am very officially a fantasy reader now with the vast majority of the books that I read in November being classed as fantasy. We've also got some middle grades, some LGBTQIA+, some young adults, some manga, some historical graphic novels, and... A whole bunch of other things too. Everything I read this month I read in a physical format. I did listen to some things as well as reading but I had a physical book for everything that I read. Now for my star rating my average is 3.58 which feels like a pretty strong month especially considering I read quite a lot. I've got one book that was a two star, nine that were three stars, six were four and then three five stars. 3.58 makes it sound like it's really really great reading month. I think I felt like I read a lot of stuff that I liked and a few things that I loved and I suppose we can start chatting about that right now. Let's talk about my lowest rating books and then we'll work up to my favorites of the month. So the only book that I gave two stars this month was Sisters of the Mist which is a children's middle grade sort of graphic novel. It's kind of like this magical realism mystical take on a coming of age and the beginning of puberty for a young girl. We're introduced to this family that has three daughters uh, and the eldest is sort of our main protagonist and we're following these kids as they're going off on their little holiday to like I think it's to their grandparents house in the middle of nowhere and there's some like interesting fantastical elements with like the environment around the home and basically we're following primarily the oldest daughter as her experience sort of changes from that of her younger sisters when she gets her period and she starts puberty. So I like the idea. I like the idea of exploring coming of age and puberty through kind of like a fantastical magical realism kind of lens. The main reason that I decided to give this two stars is because of the way that the puberty element was tackled. Basically I didn't like the approach at all and that was the whole point of the story so it was a pretty big deal. Essentially what I didn't like about it is that it felt very very rooted in a kind of second wave feminist idea of a uterus being intrinsically part of the experience of womanhood. The grandmother for example often talks about the sacred nature of periods. She talks about how this is the young girl's body preparing to have babies. Not right now but in the future. It's very much tied uterus, womanhood, motherhood all into like this beautiful sacred experience and to me that just feels quite outdated, exclusionary and if not outright turfy it feels like you know the foundations of that ideology anyway. To be clear I do think that there is definitely room for a graphic novel to explore a cis girl's experience with having her period for the first time. I just did not like the way that puberty itself and periods and uteruses and womanhood were spoken about in this particular book. I didn't like the framing of it all. Essentially I like the concept, the art was beautiful but it just didn't have any finesse or I think the required nuance to tackle this subject appropriately, especially in 2022. So as I mentioned in the stats there are nine books that I read this month that I rated with three stars and I think that speaks to the fact that I read an awful lot of graphic novels and middle fiction in particular that I personally just found okay. There was definitely elements that I could appreciate and that I you know I can find people to recommend these books to but on a personal level as a reader None of them overly excited me. So let's start with The Winterish Girl. This is a middle grade story that's been released here in Australia this year. It is very reminiscent of a lot of like the magical child books that we've been getting honestly since the Harry Potter era I suppose. Our main girl's name is Pen and she is Winterish. That is like her race, her identity. Um, but she does not live with the Winterish people. When she was three days old she was taken from her home and from her family and brought to the kingdom of Aurelia. She in particular was taken from her family because she was born on the same day as the Aurelian princess 
And basically she's kind of like forced to be the Aurelian princess's like beloved one or chosen one, but like they don't actually really get along. It's sort of like this symbolic role that Penn has to fill. But living in this society, she is hugely oppressed and spoken down to and abused and it's not very nice. In the Aurelian Kingdom, every so often, everybody gets assigned a talisman. And a talisman is like a magical object that not only gives people a particular magical power, but it also basically defines their role in society. Nobody wants Pen, the winterish girl, to get a talisman, and yet somehow she does. And a whole host of things happen from there. She meets some really interesting characters, makes some friends, challenges, a whole host of biases and assumptions people have about the winterish people. And I know some people who have absolutely adored this, like there's so much that happens and Pen herself is a wonderful character to read. I personally though found it a bit of a slog. I think that's the best way I can put it. It felt like it threw so much at the wall like there are so many elements of world building and most of it is done pretty explicitly through dialogue and like you're learning little tidbits about the world right up until the end there's just so much going on and for me that almost took me out of the world rather than bringing me into it through detail I think I would have preferred if the author had sort of chosen a handful of ideas and really just gone wild with those ideas and really sunken into those particular ideas and fleshed them out fully rather than just kind of throwing a hundred different random things at me but never really exploring them in the totality, I suppose. The characters though were definitely the best part of this book. I really enjoyed them. And then a junior fiction title that I don't have here to show you because I borrowed it from work is Every Leaf a Hallelujah. This is such a pretty cover. It's like a hardback. It's just beautiful. It's a beautiful book. This is essentially a fable about environmentalism. It's about this girl whose mother is sick and the only thing that can cure her is this very rare flower that lives in the heart of the forest. And so she goes looking for it. On that journey, the trees and the environment sort of talk to her and let her know that, you know, it's hard to find the flowers now because the forest is sick because people aren't taking care of the environment very well anymore. So it's about kindness and compassion and the connection between people and the environment uh, and just how important it is to take care of the environment and it's a very clear direct message to children about the fact that they can be a part of that they can be a part of taking care of their environment if they want to and just how important and powerful that journey can be I thought it was sweet and the illustrations and sort of the layout of the book just the whole book in general is a beautiful beautiful book the story itself I did feel like personally it was just a bit long for what it was it was fine though and it obviously had a great message another graphic novel that I borrowed from work was Festival of Shadows a Japanese ghost story this was again a large format graphic novel that was just beautiful the art is absolutely gorgeous and it's this kind of strange story about a group of people who are basically connected to the dead. Like they, every, I think it's every autumn equinox, uh, they kind of get connected with one person who has crossed over but is struggling to actually move on, move on to the next thing. And it is their job to help that ghost move on in the year that they have before the next festival. So it's quite an atmospheric kind of ghost story rather than a scary one. And I really enjoyed the tone. I think the thing that held me back from loving this was honestly it was just a bit confusing. There were some weird romances that I didn't always understand, there were some time jumps that I wasn't always following and I mean maybe it was just me reading it at the wrong time but like I at once wanted to love this but on the other hand I don't think this is going to be something that stays with me because I'm not entirely sure I understood what was going on. Mason Mooney Paranormal Investigators is a, another graphic novel that I read this month that I borrowed from work. It's part of a series, I just read the first one and it's kind of one of those spooky and funny sort of stories and it's about these kids going into a haunted house and trying to figure out what's going on uh, and there's one boy who kind of nobody likes because he's a bit he's a bit of a brat he's a bit annoying he's one of those kind of characters but he is actually a good paranormal investigator and he's up against these kind of like cool kids who are sort of just making the whole thing up so I thought this one was a good time for what it was then we've got Neverlanders which is a pretty new release graphic novel and this is a retelling of Peter Pan it's about some kids who are homeless and they live together in a, like a caravan park and they end up going off to Neverland and like there's definitely many many recognizable elements of Neverland but a lot is also switched up on its head too this is really fun and I think this would be a great pick for plenty of kids who love graphic novels for me, it was just so fast paced, like this thing did not stop, which I know for some people is a positive, 
For me, not so much. I wanted like a little bit more space to just enjoy the world and to enjoy these characters. But like, I think this, this is a really solid Peter Pan retelling in graphic novel form. It just feels really modern and alive. I think those would be the two words that I choose to describe this retelling in particular. Sea Sirens is another graphic novel that I borrowed from work and read this month. This is probably the most beautiful in terms of artwork that I read. It's just gorgeous. It's about a Vietnamese American girl who loves to surf. She lives at home with her mum and her grandfather who has Alzheimer's and also her adorable cat. And through some interesting circumstances, her and her cat end up at the bottom of the ocean in the realm of the mermaids. And the artwork for this section in particular of the underwater scenes is just gorgeous. I loved just looking at these pictures. They're so beautiful. And it kind of gave me Wizard of Oz vibes. And so I looked it up and turns out that this is kind of vaguely based on Vietnamese mythology and also the sea fairies by the author of The Wizard of Oz. So I quite liked this one, especially the world building and the art and even the characters. I liked those two. Another sea based graphic novel. Uh, this is The Girl from the Sea. Uh, this is one that I borrowed out from the library. I've got to return it. Uh, and this one is one that I've heard some really great things about and I've been wanting to read for quite a while. The art in this is lovely. It's very colorful, feels very summery, which is perfect for us here in Melbourne at the moment. And our two main characters are Morgan, who's a 15 year old girl, who's just sort of like struggling to figure herself out and a Selkie who they, they fall in love. It's gay, it's adorable, it's very, very sweet. One thing I thought was really effective were the text message conversations. Um, obviously Morgan being 15, uh, she's, she's got a group of friends and they often text and message each other, sometimes in their group chat, sometimes individually. And the way that that's represented in here is really effective. And it also, like, I think the personalities come across really well too. And I liked how through those really simple text messages, we also got to witness like the heteronormativity that the rest of Morgan's group was just kind of enforcing um, without really thinking that maybe one amongst them or maybe more, who knows, a queer. Anyway, it was really sweet. I really liked it. Alcato and the Turnip Child. This was another graphic novel that I got from work. This was probably the quirkiest amongst all of the graphic novels that I've been talking about so far. It's basically about some kids who get a witch, like the local town witch, to help them win a vegetable growing competition, like have the biggest turnip is what they want, the biggest turnip. And like there are reasons that both the witch and these kids want to do this. But when it turns out that the turnip is actually alive, like it's a person, a turnip person, all of a sudden these kids don't want to just like hand it over to the competition people where it's going to be made into a pie. So it's, it's just weird and quirky, but I really quite enjoyed this one. It was fun. Now for my four star reads, I thought we could just talk about Natsume's Book of Friends altogether. I actually did give one of the volumes three stars. Um, but I think that's just because I it was I might have read them back to back a little bit too quickly. It is a little repetitive uh, because these stories are designed to basically be standalones almost. Like you don't need to have read every single little chapter in order to be able to keep up with what's going on. That does, however, mean that there's quite a lot of repetition, especially at the beginning of each chapter, sort of letting you know what's going on. Um, but overall, I love this series. This is so cozy and adorable. Basically in this series, we're introduced to a teenage boy named Natsume and he has this strange gift of being able to see yokai, which are like spirits. Because of this gift, he's had a pretty difficult home life. He was moved around a lot because people just thought he was weird and strange. And so he keeps this part of him a secret, but he finds out that his grandmother, while she was alive, also had this gift of being able to see the yokai. And when she was alive, she didn't like them very much. So she often tricked them into giving her their name. And in this world, if you have the name of a yokai, you can control them. And so that's what Natsume's grandmother did. He has since inherited this book where she wrote down all of these names and she called it the Book of Friends. And he is now going around trying to return the names to the yokai because he doesn't, he doesn't want to be mean to them even if they have made his life a little bit difficult. So each chapter is basically us meeting a different yokai or sometimes multiple yokai and just like getting to know them and what they're up to and often learning about how their name was stolen, if not just learning about their story and their life. A lot of the stories are just really, really sweet. Overall, I'm just, I'm loving this. And this is definitely, I think, becoming sort of like a palate cleanser for me when I'm sort of like in between some big books or I just want to read something cozy without having to think too hard. 
I'm picking up a volume of this because it just makes me happy. The Prince and the Dressmaker is another graphic novel that I read this month that I honestly found quite moving while I was reading but at the same time it's not one that has really stuck with me in the weeks since I finished it. It's set in some vaguely historical period in Paris and we meet the Prince Sebastian who is sort of coming of age and his parents are wanting him to find a bride and you know get ready to become the next king. Fulfill his role of marrying and bearing an heir basically. But Sebastian has a secret and that is that he loves nothing more than to get dressed up in a pretty dress. Then one day he meets a girl named Frances who is a dressmaker. At the time we meet her, she's sort of just like pumping out dresses for like a chain store or something. Like, you know, she's not, she doesn't have the creative freedom that she would like, but she has a huge passion for the art and she also has some pretty incredible flair and design skills too. And so basically these two get together to like secretly make Sebastian some really beautiful dresses. Frances however has really strong ambitions for her future in dressmaking and design but in order to get the recognition that she deserves she needs to be able to tell people that she's making all of these beautiful dresses but she can't do that without essentially outing the prince. I say outing and I mean in terms of revealing his secret publicly. Sebastian's gender identity or sexuality is never made explicit through the book and it's not ever made like clear that he wants to be a woman. It's more that he is Sebastian sometimes, but he also likes dressing as a woman. There are some scenes that are pretty intense in terms of people finding out about Sebastian. Um, so if you're concerned about those kind of trigger warnings, definitely check those. But overall, this has a very heartwarming kind of tone. Anyway, this is a lovely touching story that explores gender in an interesting way and also relationships too. Anyway, like I said, I thought it was really sweet. I liked it a lot but it hasn't really stayed with me all that much. Then we've got A Restless Truth by Freya Mask. This is the sequel to A Marvelous Light, which I read earlier in the year. This is a historical fantasy romance series. It's going to be a trilogy, but we've just got two books so far. And I felt very similarly with A Restless Truth as I did with A Marvelous Light. And that is that I really enjoyed it. It's a cozy, good, easy read kind of time, but it never like really surprised me or went in a direction I wasn't expecting or went above and beyond in any way. But in a way, I almost, I like it for that reason. In this series, magic is part of our world, but it's kind of like an underground secret magic. And in the first book, we follow a man who is not magical, has nothing to do with the magical world, who basically gets thrown headfirst into the magical world. And through that journey, he meets a man who is a magician and they end up falling in love and forming a romance. It's very sweet. In this story, we're following the sister of one of those men. It's set on a ship and some magical stuff happens and it is queer and cute and cozy. It's, it's just very similar to the first one. The plot itself is different, but the pacing and the feeling is very similar. So it's just a cute, cozy, fun, good time. Like that was is how I would describe the series so far. I liked it. I didn't love it. I liked it. I had it at three stars originally. It's probably sitting somewhere like a three and a half, but I decided to be generous and bump it up to four because why not? It's not the sort of series I would ever rave about. Like I don't think there's anything particularly exceptional about the series. I just think it's fun and like I really looked forward to this book coming out and I definitely will read book three when that one comes out too. Silver Leaves by Gladys Milroy. This is a junior fiction title that's just been released here in Australia by an Indigenous author and it's got a lot of pictures and I think it's like a lino print kind of style. It's all black and white. I just loved this. At the beginning we're introduced to Owl and some other characters and Owl lives you know pretty comfortably with plenty of space in a tree. That is until one day a bunch of other animals come and ask if they can stay in the tree too. And when Owl asks why, where are your trees gone? It's because they've all been cut down. And so these animals don't have a home anymore. And so it's about these animals trying to find a new home and it turns into kind of like a bit of a magical story. It's a little bit slow to start, but I by the end I was tearing up. I just loved it. The art is obviously very bold and stylistic, but the story itself it's quite a short read, but it was just gorgeous. I loved it. And then Mammoth by Chris Flynn. This is a book that we read for my Blossom Book Club last month. I have actually lent it out to a friend already, so I don't have it here to show you. But this is an Australian book that was released a couple of years ago, and it's basically told from the perspective of a 13,000 year old mammoth fossil. Essentially, it's quirky historical fiction with a great narrator. We meet Mahmud, who is the mammoth fossil, um, in a warehouse where like people are preparing to auction him and many other fossils and interesting bits and pieces off. And this is an actual fossil that did exist in an actual auction that did happen. Um, and essentially this book sort of fictionalizes to an extent um, and charts the history of that fossil from the time that it was dug up and sort of like the context of American history and what was going on politically and like the symbol that people chose to make of the mammoth fossil to represent power in so many ways. It was really interesting. It was a great exploration. And we follow as the, this fossil sort of gets moved around. It goes to Europe, it goes to Ireland, 
Island and just like little bits of history in those places at those times. Basically these fossils remember their life before they died and then once they died they don't remember anything until their fossil was recovered and dug up. And now they're having this sort of second life. And it was just a really fun read. I listened to this as well as having the book and the audiobook narration was incredible. Highly recommend. So many different voices for the characters. It just really worked very well. For quite a while, I was thinking that this was going to be a five star read. I do have to say that the ending felt a little dragged out and a little unnecessary. So that's why I didn't like love, love it. But I absolutely adored like the first 200 pages and this is like a 240 page book. So like it was just a good time. And I didn't hate the ending. It just felt a little overdone, I suppose. So that's why I decided to give it four stars, but it was definitely a great read. And like I've lent it to a friend because I've been recommending it to people already. Just a really interesting way to look at history, obviously with some fictionalized elements, but just some great commentary as well on humanity and our interaction with like the environment and with the animals that we share this planet with. And now for my five star books. The first is Oxygen Mask by Jason Reynolds. This is like a graphic novel, but not in like the comic book kind of sense. It feels like an art book with a story. And this is about a young black person in America in 2020. And this is the book that the story graph categorized as nonfiction in my stats that we spoke about earlier. And it's definitely very, very nonfiction. Like it literally explores Black Lives Matter protests and the, the death of George Floyd and the experience of this young black boy sort of seeing that on TV. And then as, of course of the pandemic as well. So I can appreciate like it's very rooted in nonfiction, I suppose, even if it is sort of like a fictionalized narrative running through. I read this at work and cried within the first like 50 pages. It was just so powerful and I immediately made some of my colleagues read it too and they had a very similar response. It's a pretty quick read because like there's not a huge amount of text but I would definitely recommend sort of taking your time with this because this is one of those art books where the art feels so intentional. It doesn't feel like someone wrote a short story and then put it you know with some pretty art in the background. Like the art and the words work together perfectly and in such clever ways a lot of the time too. This was just so evocative and moving and effective and ultimately the my first thought and reaction was like this is the 2020 book. I haven't seen a huge amount of books try to tackle so explicitly the experience of 2020 and how much that hit people in the way that it did like it just everything and this book just dove headfirst right into that and it did it expertly. The next book I want to talk about is The Bookseller's Apprentice. This is actually a prequel to a book that I have not read yet and that is The Grandest Bookshop in the World. These books are set in the late 1800s in Melbourne in a bookshop that actually did exist and it features characters that were real people but obviously it's fictionalized and it is also fantasy as well. So there's magic too. In this story we meet 12 year old Billy Pike who is a young boy who lives with his family who are not wealthy by any means. They're not like poverty level struggling, but they're, you know, they're sort of just getting by. They're a pretty big family in this period, in this place. And so when he turns 12, his family expect him to get a job. And at first they want him to sort of just do what his father's doing, but he, he has no passion for that and he doesn't want to do that. So he goes and gets himself a job at the local sort of like book stall at the market. And he loves this job. He has a passion for reading and for knowledge and he loves the man that he works for, Mr. Cole. Then one day he meets a very strange tall man wearing a top hat. And he starts to hear some really kind of concerning stories about this man making promises and performing magic that always ends up going wrong. Basically, he's one of those kind of trickster characters that like promises you something and makes a deal with you. Uh, but he's very particular about the words that he uses. And so he technically does fulfill his end of the bargain, but it usually goes wrong for the person that he's made the bargain with. It's kind of that vibe. But Billy is onto him. And so he decides that he's gonna stop this guy by challenging him. And so he gets thrown into this sort of like magical mystery adventure thing that he has to solve in order to stop this bad guy with the top hat and to save the bookshop and to save Patty's market. I don't know, this just has so much personality. It's really, really well written and it's just so fun. And it definitely made me want to go back and reread the first book, which I suppose is the sequel to this. So maybe I'm just reading in chronological order rather than publishing order. That's all, that's all. It's so fun. And then my favorite book of the month and what is becoming my favorite junior fiction series is Miss Mary Kate Martin's Guide to Monsters. This is book two, The Trouble with the Two-Headed Hydra by Karen Foxley. I have the first one here, this is a proof, but the very pretty cover, I love the bright blue. Basically in the first book, we were introduced to Mary Kate and her mum, who is an archeologist. And together they sort of go around to different parts of the world. They get called out to investigate 
unusual goings on. Mary Kate's mum, the archaeologist, does like the research into like the historical significance of the place and whatever's going on. Miss Mary Kate often suspects that something magical and something a bit more unusual and unexplained is happening. And so she gets to work doing research at the libraries, interviewing the locals, you know, going off and like spying on people and all of that sort of stuff to put her own theories together of what's really going on. In this second book, we're off to the Greek islands. And as much as I liked the first one, like I really, really liked the first one. I think I gave it four stars. This second one was just even better. Like it was so good and so fun. The Greek islands as the setting was perfect. It just was evoked so well through the writing. And Miss Mary Kate makes friends with a local boy who like takes her around on a bike and they just like ride all around the islands and they are off on boats. Like it just, it feels so fun. As with the first book, one of my favorite things about Mary Kate as a character is that she's quite an anxious girl. And we, we see her anxiety come up for her in different ways. And we also see her managing her anxiety in different ways. And I just love that kind of like casual in the book representation. But I also just love these characters. I love the idea. Karen Foxley's writing is wonderful. And I love how at the end of the day, we get to meet these really unusual, unique monsters from different mythologies and folk tales. And we get to see Mary Kate interacting with them in a really compassionate way. It's just, it's beautiful. I love it. The first one had a little bit of a message about, you know, overdevelopment and how that impacts the environment. Uh, this second one sort of took that up another notch and there's quite a lot of discussion about pollution of the ocean and things like that and how that affects animals too. So there's a good strong message in there too but the adventure and the fun and the heart of it is never lost for the sake of the message. It's just such a well-rounded story. This series is marketed for six to ten year olds so it's definitely sort of like the junior and middle fiction, the younger end of middle fiction and it's just one of my favorites to recommend. I love it. Okay so those are the 19 books that I read in the month of November. I hope you had fun hanging out with me and chatting books. I'd love to hear in the comments below what your standout reads of November were and before I go I have to say a big thank you to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon for all of their support and especially big thank you goes to Olivia, Lynette Brown and Marie. But that's all from me. Thanks for hanging out. I'll talk to you in the comments and in the next video. Until then, happy reading. Bye!